me stupid. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. As requested, today we're diving into the recently released Five Nights at Freddy's, directed by Emma Tammy, based on the popular indie game franchise developed by Scott Cawthon. Starring Josh Hutcherson, Piper Rubio, Elizabeth Lale, Matthew Lillard, and Mary Stuart Masterson, the film revolves around former mall cop Mike Schmidt, who's struggling to make ends meet and take care of his sister Abby. Driven by desperation, and perhaps a smidge of poor judgement, Mike signs on for a gig at the notoriously forsaken Pizzeria, a locale whispered about in hushed tones at every local diner. And as if tempting fate, he drags his unsuspecting sister into this eerie escapade. As the duo delves deeper into the bowels of the dimly lit establishment, they don't just stumble upon rusted ovens and stale pizza. Instead, they're greeted by tormented phantoms and vindictive animatronics, all itching for a little midnight tango. But as the chilling nights unfold, it becomes clear that the siblings aren't just battling external horrors, they're wrestling with the ghosts of their own past. Aided by a cryptic cop with motives as shadowy as the pizzeria's backrooms, the unlikely trio must navigate a maze of malevolence, uncover the ominous enigmas that Freddy Fazbear's pizza jealously guards, and most importantly, survive. In this video, we're going to explore the game series, the characters, and the ending of the film. Five Nights at Freddy's, an indie game franchise developed by Scott Cawthon, is far more than just a series of jump scares. At its core lies a deeply intricate narrative, replete with unsolved mysteries, malevolent animatronics, and tragic family histories. The foundation of the universe is grounded in the sinister history of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, a fictional children's entertainment venue and its animatronic entertainers. At first glance, they merely function as entertainers during the day and erratic machines at night. However, as the series progresses, players uncover the chilling truth. They are haunted by the restless spirits of children who met tragic fates. Central to the series is William Afton, often referred to as the Purple Guy, who is initially introduced as a shadowy, dark figure responsible for the death of several children at Freddy's Pizza. And I am forever cursed. I can never leave. <laughs> <laughs> Their spirits, thought to be seeking vengeance and trapped in purgatory, are believed to inhabit the animatronic suits, setting the stage for the eerie events in the games. It's important to note the series isn't just a collection of horror games, it is a narrative-driven exploration of tragedy, vengeance, and the lingering shadows of the past. Through hidden clues, cryptic mini-games, and nuanced storytelling, Scott Cawthon and his developers crafted a lore-rich universe that captivates players and theorists alike. The franchise stands as a testament to the fact that even indie games with limited graphics and restricted settings can weave tales as profound and haunting, if not more so, than any big-budget title. You played right into our hands. Did you really think that this job just fell out of the sky for you? No. Now we can do what we were created to do and be complete. I will make you proud, Daddy. Watch and be full. In the haunting, dim-lit confines of an aging family entertainment center, eerily reminiscent of Chuck E. Cheese, a petrified security guard fumbles with an air duct vent. As the lens teasingly drifts over monitors, showcasing various chambers of Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria, our guard is taken hostage, only to awaken to an impending nightmare, a bear mask outfitted with menacing gears and springs inching towards his face. Enter our protagonist, Mike Schmidt, a mall cop who, after an unfortunate case of mistaken kidnapper identity, finds his career downgraded. We got this new flavor, Rainbow Explosion. Hey! Daddy! 
Unsure what to do next, he meets up with the enigmatic career counselor, Steve Raglan, who teases an offer for him to be the nocturnal protector of Freddy's. But this isn't just any pizzeria. It's an 80s relic, mysteriously preserved. You want the job or not? How's the pay? Not great, but the hours are worse. I can't do nights. Mike predictably hesitates, for nocturnal duties hardly seem as cup of tea. But when you're on the brink of losing your beloved little sister to the unsympathetic claws of social services and a vampy Aunt Jane waiting in the wings, you do what you gotta do. As he returns to his sanctum, we're introduced to a babysitter named Max who's taking care of his younger sister Abby for free, a child struggling to connect with others after the death of their parents. Well, that good-looking guy I recognize. Who are all these other punks? My friends. Well, look, you can finish up after we eat, all right? With the day that I'm having, can you just eat some food? You're sitting on my friend. You know what? Do whatever you want. Mike is effectively playing the role of big brother and guardian to Abby, and as he drifts into a slumber beneath a picturesque Nebraska woodland poster with Nature Symphony from a cassette, he's transported to a recurring memory and nightmare. Within the gossamer threads of a dream, he finds himself ensconced in the tranquil woods of Nebraska. Accompanying him are his parents and his younger brother Garrett. Yet serenity takes a grim turn as Mike, who is charged with watching over Garrett, turns around to find his brother in the unsavory clutches of an abductor. The car's engine revs, tires screech, and Mike is rendered a helpless spectator to his brother's distressing fate once more. Garrett! As dawn breaks, Mike's reality poses yet another trial, a tense meeting with Aunt Jane and her legal counsel. Her motivation is to claim custody over Abby and the accompanying governmental stipend. Thankfully, Abby's crayon masterpieces, with Mike as a recurring protagonist, paint a compelling argument for the caseworker that he is indeed the best person to look after her. The only problem is that Mike must secure employment to prove this, and pronto. And so, calling the enigmatic career counselor Steve, Mike accepts the gig and hesitantly embarks on his nocturnal adventure at Freddy's. The backdrop changes to the pizzeria's echoing halls, where an old cassette training tape beckons, portraying Freddy's in its glory days of laughter and frolic. Welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, a magical place for kids and grown-ups alike. Let's introduce you to the stars of the show. But all is not as it seems, as a curious balloon boy statuette in a locker sends chills down Mike's spine. Not only that, but dreams ensnare him once more, haunting memories of Garrett Aback, albeit with an odd congregation of children who give Peter Pan's lost boys a run for their money. Did you see who took my brother? Wait! No! Their giggles and fleeting steps leave him with more questions than answers, and as dawn beckons, Mike returns home to find solace. Segway to a kitschy diner, where Jane is conspiring with a seemingly trustworthy Max and her shifty brother Jeff, all while being served by MatPat. That lunch is the most important meal of the day. Thought it was breakfast. Some people say that, but you know, it's just a theory. Are you being paid by the word? While we thought Max was helping Mike out of the goodness of her heart, we discover that Jane had actually hired her as a domestic spy, hoping to dig up dirt that could be used against Mike. Of course, proving that she is an awful person. When Mike admits that his downside was simply his proclivity to slumber excessively, Jane refuses to pay. Yet, ever the scheme is, Jane and Jeff hatch a plan targeting Freddy's, hoping to add another termination to Mike's already checkered employment history. We mess up the place good. Your nephew gets canned. The judge gives you the kid, and you give us $2,000. Amidst the echoes of the pizzeria, Mike tries to find comfort with the familiar Nebraska poster and the entrancing tape of nature sounds to propel him back to his recurring dream. As sleep envelops him, he once again plunges into the harrowing abyss of Garrett's abduction, accompanied by the same mysterious children. Their elusive antics persist, but Mike's resolve to identify the abductor intensifies. Capturing one, he seeks clarity, only to be attacked in the dream. A sudden knock at the door ushers him back to reality, revealing Vanessa, a police officer whose territory includes this nostalgia-ridden establishment. Her eyes betray a familiarity as she confesses to the pizzeria's once jubilant past, and somehow, Mike's dream-induced scratch mirrors reality, revealing a massive gash to his hand, prompting Vanessa's caregiving instincts. Here, Officer Shelley dishes out grim tales of 80s child murders, MIA bodies, and the restaurant's rather questionable decision to keep hosting children's parties. Venturing further, Vanessa flicks a switch, animating a motley crew of animatronics. Freddy, the inscrutable bear, Chica, the vivacious chicken, Bunny, the lavender rabbit with a flair for drama, Foxy, the swashbuckling pirate fox, and the eloquent Mr. Cupcake. Prepare to have your mind blown. Wanna dance? 
Their spirited performances, however, are cut short by a power outage. Exiting, Vanessa drops a curious factoid. Security guards at Freddy's tend to have rather transient tenures. Some friendly advice? Don't let this place get to you. Just do your job and you'll be fine. Yeah, sounds good. As day yields to night, Max, the Sly Jeff, and their accomplices brazenly infiltrate the pizzeria's vaulted walls, greedily pocketing relics and destroying the equipment. But little do they realize the animatronics are no longer mere spectators. With the stage set, Chica, along with the articulate Mr. Cupcake, encounter one of the intruders. <gasps> In the dimly lit, nostalgia-filled halls of the pizzeria, Chica, in a performance that would make any baseball pitcher jealous, deftly hurls Mr. Cupcake, who proceeds to provide a rather aggressive facial makeover to the unlucky thief. The eerie symphony continues as Bonnie, always the headbanger, introduces another intruder to the brutal elegance of a door. Meanwhile, the poetic duet of Mr. Cupcake and Foxy ensnare Jeff, whose eventual fate is interwoven with spare parts. Amidst this chaos, Max, perhaps driven by curiosity or sheer audacity, chases the specter of a child, leading her straight into Freddy's mechanical jaws. Unfortunately, in a jaw-dropping spectacle, Max finds herself quite literally caught between Freddy's bite. Come sunrise, Vanessa graces Mike's abode, making the acquaintance of Abby. With a mix of concern and accusation, the officer explains his workplace was trashed, subtly implicating Mike for seemingly leaving the pizzeria doors unlocked the night before. Yet what truly captures her inquisitiveness is a bottle of Mike's sleeping aids. Wearied by guilt over Garrett's mysterious vanishing act and the subsequent demise of his parents, Mike reveals he's embarking on a nightly sojourn into his subconscious, hoping to see the face of the man that took his brother. Using the backdrop of Nebraska and nature's ambient notes as a catalyst, he aims to unearth a latent memory that might unveil the abductor's identity. Intriguingly, Freddy's, with its haunting charm and mythical ambience, appears to be amplifying the vividness of these dreams. You and Abby, you still have each other. No more sleeping on the job. When you're at Freddy's, you stay alert. With Max conspicuously absent, in a moment of questionable judgment, Mike brings Abby along and introduces her to Freddy's nocturnal allure. After constructing a cozy fortress of pillows for her and navigating the aftermath of the earlier break-in, not to mention another eerie encounter with Balloon Boy, Mike drifts into slumber. And like any curious child, Abby awakens, tiptoeing into a maze that is the pizzeria. Within the recesses of Mike's dreamlike reverie, he probes the spectral children with an age-old query. Are they the lost souls from the 80s? You're those kids, right? The ones who disappeared? I don't know how it's possible that you're here like this in my dream, but I need your help. Their affirmations resonate, and their sandy artwork, a rabbit, whispers tales of their captor. But the ethereal communion is abruptly disrupted by the unmistakable screams of his sister. Racing towards the cacophony, Mike encounters a tableau most unexpected. Animatronics renowned for their frights, indulging in the innocent art of tickling. Abby's embrace of these mechanical marvels speaks volumes, and her commentary, pure gold. She believes that the animatronics are merely vessels for ghostly tenants with a penchant for movement. So those, uh, machines... My friends? Are they... Ghosts? Of course. How else could they make the robot to move? As another night falls upon Freddy's, the duo is greeted by Vanessa once again, her prior knowledge of the animatronic's peculiar sentient status now evident. What unfolds is a surprisingly heartwarming montage of human-robot camaraderie. You did it! Are you okay? However, amidst the merriment, Vanessa pulls Mike aside, her frustration with him palpable. Taking him to a clandestine chamber, she unveils the chilling mechanics of the animatronics, laying bare the lethal potential of those spring-loaded contraptions. They were designed to keep the animatronic parts in place so that a person could safely wear the suit. It tend to be pretty unstable. Her stern advice? Abandon the perilous quest for Garrett and keep Abby far from Freddy's embrace. Yet Mike, ever the tenacious spirit, refuses to give up on his brother. Trying to prioritize Abby's safety, he engages his aunt for babysitting duties, much to the rage of his sister, all while plunging back into the enigmatic dream realm. This time, a spectral child steps forward, confirming their ghostly possession of the animatronics, which echo Abby's astute observations. The pieces of the puzzle it seems are slowly converging, and in a peculiar barter within Mike's dreamscape, a child crafts a Faustian proposition, blissful never-ending dreams with Garrett and his parents in exchange for Abby. We can be together with him again. How? You said we could have anything we wanted. We want Abby. 
While the offer is tempting, Mike's better judgment ultimately triumphs, provoking the anger of the eerie beings. But as he wakes up from his nocturnal ordeal, Foxy delivers a swift blackout. In an unexpected twist, taking the term home invasion to new levels, Freddy dispatches Jane and invites the gleeful Abby back to the pizzeria. The two depart in what can only be described as the most bizarre taxi ride, driven by none other than the inimitable Corey Williams. Where to, little lady? Oh my goodness! <laughs> we then pick up with the captured Mike, who, bound to a chair, stares death in the face, or rather, into the mouth of that perilous Freddy mask. Enter Vanessa, the savior of the moment, revealing a dark tapestry of William Afton's malevolent deeds. Turns out she's in fact the daughter of the child murderer who kickstarted the Freddy Fazbear horror saga. And not only did William kidnap Garrett and others, but to cover his crimes, he hid their bodies in the animatronics. It wasn't long until their spirits possessed the animatronics and manipulated by Afton, the robots began to carry out his dark wishes. In the 80s when those kids went missing, the man who took them, he was a very cruel man. It's not just their ghosts that are inside of those machines, it's their bodies. In a sordid tale of abductions, animatronic tombs, and spiritual possessions, the pieces align. Abby is most definitely in peril, with the robots wanting her to join them in death and robotic resurrection. Here, Mike's impassioned plea for assistance is met with Vanessa's sorrowful reluctance, yet she does arm him with sage advice, a trusty taser, and a cattle prod. With the electrifying sting of the taser, Mike temporarily disables a few animatronics, leading to a heart-stopping confrontation. Abby, in the cruel grasp of Chica and Mr. Cupcake, narrowly avoids a chilling fate within a marionette suit and is reunited with Mike, who vows to stick by her forever. I've been an idiot about so many things. I've been stuck trying to fix the past, but you are the most important thing in the world to me, and I promise you I'm going to do better. In a cinematic crescendo, their exit is stopped by the entry of none other than the Yellow Rabbit. Mike, clearly having missed his calling as a professional wrestler, squares off against the bunny, while Foxy, in a sly game of cat and mouse, tells Abby, Luckily, Vanessa intervenes in the nick of time, armed with a taser, addressing the rascally rabbit as dad, who removes his mask and reveals he was William Afton, masquerading as Steve Raglan all along. Their father-daughter reunion is punctuated with William cordially stabbing Vanessa. Simultaneously, Mike, channeling his inner art teacher, urges Abby to sketch. Moved by the drawings she made illustrating how William killed them in the past, the robots remember what he did to them and take their revenge. In a moment of poetic justice, William gets ensnared by the spring-lock mechanism of his suit and is whisked away by his own creations. <laughs> Fast-forwarding a few days, the siblings, showcasing a renewed bond, visit a comatose Vanessa and thank her for helping them. Abby also ponders the loneliness of the ghostly children, hinting at a potential Freddy's reunion. Mike, not entirely dismissing the idea, muses on the future. However, unbeknownst to them, William, confined in his bunny attire, clings to life at Freddy's. Finally, a post credit stinger showcases the taxi driver's shock as he discovers the Balloon Boy statue in his back seat, setting the tone for potential sequels and spin-offs. I said read the su There's very few games that were creepier than Five Nights at Freddy's, and so I was excited about the challenge of seeing if we could uh, make Scott comfortable enough to turn this into a, into a movie. The premise of the original game was sheer genius in its simplistic terror, an evil, twisted iteration of Chuck E. Cheese. Those 80s pizzerias with their janky animatronics felt eerily off, and Cawthon simply turned the dial up. Suddenly, Chuck E. Cheese outlets were ditching animatronics faster than a cat sheds fur in summer. The in-game rationale for these mechanical menaces in its first iteration was comically dark, let them wander about or their rust. But if they spot a human who shouldn't be there post-operational hours, they'd mistakenly clothe them in a spare suit, leading to a grim demise. We knew that the visibility from the fan base was super high. There's a lot of attention to detail. There's so much in the movie that speaks to the fan base. In the film, we're introduced to our insomniac security guard embarking on his soiree at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. On his inaugural night, it becomes abundantly clear that his job won't be just the regular observe and report. With the layers peeled back, a sinister past at Freddy's comes into the spotlight. Instead of surveying these eerie automatons via CCTV, Josh Hutchison's Mike, our beleaguered guard, chooses to indulge in some shut-eye. Miraculously unscathed, Mike slumbers are however haunted by a past trauma. 
his younger brother's mysterious vanishing act, and as the plot unfurls, it appears Mr. Fazbear's first name isn't just for show. He seems to share the same dream-weaving traits with another infamous Freddy, and just as a cherry on top, both Freddys seem to have impeccable taste in headgear. This movie is basically about a guy who gets a job working at this pizzeria from the 80s that's abandoned, and once inside, madness ensues. The audiences are in for a ride. You will be blown away. It's the ultimate popcorn movie. Director Emma Tammy, the maestro behind the wind, tantalizingly teases us with the reveal of the famed animatronics. Shadows dance, posters loom, and juvenile sketches play a slow-burning preamble before she grandiosely unveils what we've all been waiting for. We wanted to make sure we were doing the fan base justice in every decision that we made along the way. They were really at the forefront of our minds. Scott Coffin is heavily involved and is watching every single shot. So I think for those hardcore Five Nights at Freddy's fans out there, they can rest assured that we are taking care of their game and taking care of these characters. Hutchison skillfully embodies a man grappling with the shadows of his past while endeavoring to provide for his younger sister Abby, portrayed with heartfelt sincerity by Piper Rubio. Their world teeters on the brink of upheaval as their conniving aunt, masterfully portrayed by Mary Stuart Masterson, looms with threats of custody battles. As the secondary antagonist, Masterson brings a cold and calculative menace to the role, chewing up every scene she's in. We knew the design and build of the animatronics was gonna be such a huge component of the film. We paired up with Jim Henson's Creature Shop to do that, and they just added a whole other dimension to this production, and I think it lies in the space between them being alive and not, not alive. And I think it's that soul, for lack of a better word, that is so eerie and amazing and wild and at times friendly. In a desperate bid to maintain stability, Mike finds himself accepting a seemingly mundane job as a night security guard at the now desolate Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, a recommendation from his counselor, deftly portrayed by Matthew Lillard. The narrative hooks you in, with our protagonist quickly evolving into an emotional anchor. The enigma enveloping Mike's dreams, serving up the appetizing subplot, keeps you tethered as one remains ravenous to decipher this Garrett conundrum. Mike's turbulence, his yearning to rewind the hands of time, paints him in relatable strokes, making the viewer's heartstrings play a melancholic tune. Hutchison shines brilliantly as the complex and sympathetic Mike. The character could have easily been dismissed as abrasive and ensnared in his trauma, but is rendered vulnerable under Hutchison's touch. Those sporadic glimmers of warmth piercing through Mike's rugged exterior are testament to the actor's understated talent. Indeed, he becomes the pulsating heartbeat of the film, conveying more disquiet and tension than any looming animatronic threat. Had it been just another tale of a guard navigating the labyrinth of law surrounding sentient animatronics, we might have been left yearning for more meat on the bone. But the overarching connection to Mike's past is what lends the tale its gravitas and depth. Josh brought this really grounded approach to the character of Mike, who's bringing us through the pizzeria and then these five nights. He, uh, so, you know, he's our conduit going through the whole story. So he knew he needed to land it, and he really did. He's, he's awesome. One can't help but be pulled into the labyrinth of emotion surrounding the mysterious disappearance of Mike's brother, a haunting echo from his past that has made him the broken compass he is today. While he remains entrenched in yesteryears, young Abby, radiantly portrayed by Rubio, implores him to embrace the present. Through Hutchison's display of despair and trepidation, the character's internal tussle between past specters and current realities becomes palpably relatable. All the animatronics have such a personality. If there's a time when Freddy should be scary or intimidating, he stands tall, the movement is slow and ominous. Sometimes it's the subtlety that really sells the character. Amid the ensemble, Elizabeth Lale shines as a budding policewoman. But let's be candid, it's Lillard who effortlessly steals the limelight, even in his fleeting appearance. One of the film's most captivating threads is Mike's ability to harness his dreams, a desperate attempt to revisit that fateful day and unmask his brother's abductor. While intriguing, this subplot occasionally overshadows the true luminaries, Freddy, Foxy, Chica, Bonnie, and Mr. Cupcake. The animatronics, splendidly wrought and imbued with a haunting patina of neglect, pay a sublime homage to their video game origins. Hats off to the creative team at Jim Henson's Creature Shop for creating the memorable cast. A nostalgic nod to the animatronic bands of old, but with a sinister twist guaranteed to make even the bravest technophile quiver in their boots. Bathed in an aura of dirt and sporting unchanging, eerie grimaces, these animatronics stagger about with an amusing stiffness, their range of expression limited to malevolent leering. They traverse hallways and backrooms, echoing vibes of Michael Myers, but with far few facial muscles to twitch. First I killed your brother, now I kill you. Symmetry, my friend. <laughs> Little ones tell me you have a sister. 
She will love it here! Penned by the collective genius of Cawthon, Tammy, and Cutback, the movie adheres to the foundational elements of the game. Animatronics with a sinister streak and a beleaguered security guard fighting for survival. Yet it also introduces an additional storyline, enriching the narrative tapestry while occasionally causing the pacing to meander. You know, the animatronics are like a whole other cast in our film, so we knew they needed the utmost amount of attention, and no one is more equipped to have brought these creatures to life than Jim Henson's workshop. I think Foxy, at full movement capacity, took six puppeteers to operate. So we were using a lot of really, really talented people to make these characters come to life in the most nuanced and detailed of ways. The twist involving Officer Shelley's clandestine ties to Freddy's holds promise, though it feels somewhat rushed. And by the time we unearth the chilling truth about the sinister orchestrator behind the curtains, the narrative build-up feels a tad too late, leaving one almost relieved to see the credits roll. In an audacious cinematic maneuver, Tammy dangles a tantalizing plot revelation regarding William's entanglement with Mike and Vanessa's destinies. Yet much like an elusive dessert promised but delivered post-digestion, this revelation was a bit late in the story. And while we're cataloging missed opportunities, the animatronic saga, supposedly the film's crux, felt like a side note in a symphony that demanded a crescendo. One would think the chilling premise of William turning his kidnapped victims into animatronics would elevate the plot's eeriness, but alas, it seemed to get lost in translation. The movie's all-ages welcome approach, attempting to cater to both young and the season, perhaps diluted what could have been a richer exploration of William's malevolence. As a result, the narrative thread of the ill-fated children feels more like a melancholic postscript than a poignant tragedy, a consequence perhaps of the film not investing enough into their backstories, leaving audiences grappling to foster a genuine connection with them. But strip away its horror veneer and its game franchise lineage, and Five Night at Freddy's is a tantalizing roller coaster of emotions, centered around Mike and Abby. Mike's evolution into Abby's unwavering protector, squaring off against a domineering Aunt Jane, is a captivating odyssey. And Abby, with her innocent illustrations, nudges the narrative into an enthralling climax, underscoring the oft underestimated perceptiveness and agency of children. Despite its occasional fumbles, the journey concludes on a heartwarming note with Mike and Abby standing tall as a formidable duo, making every narrative detour worthwhile. He brought such an admiration for the franchise and the characters of the animatronics and the world, but also knew he was forging new ground here with this character and was so dedicated to finding the truth in Mike. When it comes to the animatronics, their killing spree, primarily targeting a motley crew of thieves, satiates the bloodlust of fans. Yet their surprising camaraderie with Abby and relative indifference towards Mike and Vanessa derails their menace factor. While Hutchison broods and the animatronics remain largely tight-lipped, barring the occasional lip-syncing performances, Matthew Lillard, in a delightful twist, infuses the narrative with a bit of buoyancy. Embracing his role as the hiring staffer, he revels in the ironic twist of turning his iconic shaggy persona on its head, positioning him as the mastermind behind a haunted enterprise. And Lillard seems to be the only one winking at the audience, letting us in on the jest. I always come back. <laughs> Tonally, the film is reminiscent of killer clowns from outer space, with the deaths balanced between humor and horror, hoping to evoke both chuckles and chills. From jittery surveillance footage to the haunting labyrinth of Mike's recurring nightmares, Tammy crafts a gripping tale of a man diving deep into his psyche, desperately piecing together his brother's enigmatic departure. Under her direction, Freddy becomes an eerie domain that feels otherworldly, yet not inhospitable to the gentle soul of Abby. Abby! Mike! They wouldn't stop tickling me. I said I was gonna die. With Lynn Moncrief behind the lens, the camera captures moments with a haunting precision, making the confined setting pulsate with foreboding vibes. Meanwhile, the Newton brothers lay down beats that'll make your heart race, while Mark Fischella's sets make you reminisce about a time of neon lights and arcade battles. The horror here isn't superficial. It brings real stakes to the table, keeping the viewer engaged. And Tammy manages to extract genuine frights early on, particularly in a pulse racing sequence where miscreants encounter more than they bargain for at Freddy's. Subsequently, the film dips its toes into psychological horror, achieving an ambiance of unease, albeit inconsistently. It's a film that dares to splash more crimson on the screen than most PG-13 horrors would dare to. But as I said earlier, it's more of a psychological thriller that seems to have taken a rain check on the quintessential Fright Night Fair. Credit where credit's due, the script doesn't sugarcoat its dark themes, be it kidnappings, sinister murders, or other gory spectacles. 
ghostly children make appearances, the plot convolutes, and by the conclusion, it's evident that the real horrors aren't the lumbering animatronics, but the monsters that walk among us. The filmmakers crafted this piece as an elaborate love letter to fans, particularly those on the younger side. As adults, we might find the dialogue teetering on the edge of kitsch, and the scares, well, they occasionally hide shyly behind shadows or out of frame, much like a child peeking from behind a curtain. But viewed from the lens of burgeoning horror enthusiasts and children, this film serves as a gateway to both the realm of spine tinglers and the deliciously campy subgenre we've all secretly relished. Certainly, adaptations often play fast and loose with their source material. In this case, the narrative leans more heavily on the literary side of the spectrum, drawing substance from its pages while sprinkling in a smattering of video game knots. The resulting concoction rims with easter eggs and references. The live-action adaptation effectively weaves a narrative rich in themes of isolation, familial ties, and the haunting spectre of past mistakes. And although the pacing occasionally falters, the film succeeds in offering an engaging experience for both avid fans of the game and families seeking a spooky adventure. To distill it down, Five Nights at Freddy's is a cinematic cocktail of thrills and chills tailored for both the young and the young at heart. While the narrative may have its occasional hiccups, the film remains an exhilarating rollercoaster of emotions. Guys, I'm back! Abby. I miss you guys. Look at the nasty things that you have become. Look how small you are. You are wretched, rotten little beast. I was just thinking about my friends. They're all alone. No one takes care of them anymore. Can we visit them sometime? With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore Five Nights at Freddy's. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and check out the film Comics Explained podcast on the second channel. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Let go! I won't let you hurt her too. Shit! <laughs>